John, did I already share my screen to the group or to the class? Yes, both, sir. Okay. So this time, our discussion is all about learning activity number eight, which is all about the nematodes. So if you try to observe, if you have an idea about uh, what nematodes are, these are specifically the worms. So if you're going to ask me, Sir Yong, Dok Yong, why do we need to discuss about the nematodes? If we try to go back from our course description, uh, our subject is all about microbiology, parasitology. So we are already uh, we already uh, done with our discussion for microorganisms. So what we are going to do right now is we are going to cover um, topics related to parasitology. So one of the main thing that we are going to consider when we talk about parasitology is all about the nematodes. So nematodes are fundamentally under the class nematoda and they are uh, known as the, the round worms. So if we will try to go back from what parasitology is, uh, basically parasitology is the field of biology or field of science that deals about the different uh, microorganisms that are interacting with another organism in a parasitic type uh, of relationship. So meaning to say in that particular relationship, there is what we call parasites and there is also what we call the host, okay? So when we talk about the parasite, these are those organisms that benefits the, the host or the other organism, while the, the host is the one that refers to those organisms that, then, uh, that are basically providing nutrients for the parasites and to the point of even consuming their body by the parasites. So in the, par in the parasitic relationship class, we have to understand that they are following a plus minus relationship. So plus in the sense that the parasites is the one that will benefit from the host while the negative is referring to the host because upon consuming and upon acquiring uh, nutrients from the host and upon uh, using the host as a habitat for the parasites to grow and to develop, then this would cause the host to be uh, at risk in terms of its survival as well as for development. So that's why the relationship for parasitic relationship is a plus minus since the, the parasite will be in advantage of that particular relationship while the, the host is considered to be an organism that will be uh, in a negative aspect in relation to, the, to, the, to such relationship. So, so the first so when we talk about parasites, there are actually two classifications of parasites. So this classification is based upon the location of where we can find the parasites. So when we talk about the ectoparasites, these are referring to those parasites that are living outside the, the, the host. So when we are talking about the lice, when we are talking about those fungi that would fundamentally cause such infection or diseases, then we would um, consider those parasites are as ectoparasites. However, when we talk about um, the endoparasites, which is another classification of parasites, these are those parasites that are living inside the body of the host. Okay, so one of the, uh, the be best example, if we are talking about the Endoparasites are the nematodes, okay? So like what I have said earlier, the nematodes are referring to the round worms, which are living inside the body, and they are probably considered as the most abundant animal on earth. So uh, although by documents, insects are considered to be the most, uh, the, the, the most abundant animals, but however, we need to consider as well the nematodes uh, as the most abundant because there are still undescribed free living species of nematodes that are yet to be discovered. So in terms of the professionals, there are more uh, entomologists that 
who discovers insects rather than nematologists. So that's why there are still undescribed free-living species of roundworms that are yet to be discovered in order for these species of nematodes to be added in the number of those species that are discovered. So, but still the nematodes are probably considered as the most abundant animals on earth. So the roundworms are actually belong to class nematoda uh, and um, these nematodes or parasites may live in a specific uh, or in a variety of hosts or some of them may live in a specific uh, type of host. Okay, so uh, in this learning activity number eight, our primary uh, goal is to let our students understand or name the different representatives under the group of nematodes and we will be able to characterize the different stages of each identified parasites. Okay, so uh, one, the nematodes or the roundworms belong to class nematoda because of these general characteristics. So when we talk about these characteristics, we are referring to those morphological description that are true to all species of nematodes. So regarding that nematodes are long, they are short, they are rounded, they have this particular shapes and, and structure, uh, these characteristics can be seen in each of the species of the nematodes. Okay, so one of the general characteristics of the nematodes is that they are bilaterally symmetrical. Okay, so when we talk about bilaterally, bilaterally symmetrical, this is similar to the human organism because for the roundworms, even if their structure in transverse section are rounded, when we are going to divide the right portion and the, light, the left portion of the nematodes or the roundworms, they are considered to be bilaterally symmetrical. Same with the human organisms. Now, if you're going to ask me, Sir Yong or Dok Yong, why they are described as bilaterally symmetrical, it is because the right portion of the nematode's body is a reflection or the mirror image of the of the left portion, which means say that what can we see, what parts can we see, what parts we can see in the right portions are also the same parts that we can see in the left portion of the roundworm's body. So if you take a look, or if you are going to observe the human organisms, if we have the left ear, we also have the right ear. If we have the right hand, we also the, the left hand. So that's what makes the roundworms bilaterally symmetrical. Another characteristics that, that the roundworms have is that they are unsegmented or non-segmented, okay? So um, when we are talking about seg segment segmentation or segments, we are referring to the fact <clears throat> that these, that a specific organisms are segmented if there is a specific division or sections in their body, okay? One of the reasons why do some of the animals may exhibit segmentation or uh, sections in their, body, in their body parts, it's because of their structure or positioning of their mus muscles or musculatures. So in the case of the, the roundworms or the nematodes, they, they don't have such segmentations or muscles that would leave them to produce divisions on their parts of their body, okay? So that's why the nematodes are considered to be unsegmented. Now, if you're going to ask me, Sir Yong, Dok Yong, if the muscles are primarily the criterion in providing segmentation to one particular animal organism, why do, why do we don't have such sections in our body? Actually, class, uh, in our case, in the human organism, even if we do have a musculature or the muscular system that, are dis that is distributed all throughout our body, our body is not really segment segmented or you have this what we call sectioning 
it is because our muscles are not uniform in terms of their appearance. So our muscles, some are short, some are long, some are just uh, positioned in one particular uh, long bones, while others are actually situated or restricted in one particular sections in our uh, bone that are usually uh, uh, in our body that are usually attached in our bones. Diba? If you try to observe, our bones as well are not uniform in terms of their characteristics. That's why, although we have the muscles that are supposedly used for us to have this segmentation, but we don't really have, since the muscles that we have are not in uniform appearance, then we don't have such concrete segmentation. However, if we are going to um, dissect our muscles and expose the muscles by removing our skin, we can still see the parallel arrangement of our muscles. So some of our muscles are, are originated from this particular portion of the long bone and they are inserted to another portion or another end of one particular bone. Now going back to the nematodes, they don't have such uniform uh, musculature that will provide them proper sectioning on their body parts. Okay, although they don't have any segments, but the the but the body of the the round, round worms are basically supported and protected by this particular layer known as the cuticle. Okay, so cuticle is a strong, flexible non-cellular layer which is used to cover and protect the body parts of the roundworms. Okay, so aside from the cuticle, another characteristic that we need to consider is that the roundworms has a simple body plan. Simple body plan in the sense that they don't have a complex systems in their body. Okay, their shapes are usually elongated where it is tapered at both ends. So if um, elongated and tapered at both ends, because if you try to look on the, the body structure of the nematodes, their middle portion is basically expanded or broader or wider compared to the terminal portion, both the the anterior as well as the posterior portion of which it is um, tapered or pointed. Okay, so talking about the, the nematodes, the nematodes are primarily uh, grow in terms of their uh, body structure. We need to understand that in the case of the nematodes, their growth occurs primarily by means of cell enlargement. Okay, and another thing, if we are talking about the systems of the nematodes, uh, they only have a specific, they don't have such systems in the sense that they don't have any complete uh, systems except for the digestive system. So if we are going to ca characterize the digestive system of the nematodes, it is actually described as complete. Now, Dok Yong, what makes the digestive system complete? It is because it has a front opening and it also has the, the uh, posterior or ca caudal opening. And they have the presence of the gut. Meaning to say, uh, the digestive system is considered to be complete if it has an opening in the middle portion. So the opening uh, anteriorly is being uh, provided by the presence of the mouth. So this mouth leads to the buccal cavity. So the buccal cavity is actually an opening that contains the buccal capsule as well as the teeth which is used to grind the food materials. So mainly the anterior opening, which is the first opening of the digestive system, is used to cater for ingestion of food materials. So, so this food materials will be traveling from the buccal capsule, to the pharynx, to the esophagus, and make basically in the middle portion, which is the gut. 
So this gut is the area where the intestines are located in order for the digestion and the absorption of food materials will take place. And, and uh, after the digestion and absorption, all the undigested materials, or shall we say waste materials, will be released now in the opening, which is the anus. Okay? So we need to understand, class, that in the case of the nematodes, um, their anus generally are the same in all of the anus as the caudal opening of the other organisms because this anal opening uh, or the caudal opening is the one that is used for the release of all those undigested materials which are already uh, have undergone the process of digestion and absorption. Okay, so uh, if the the animals don't have such uh, opening, both uh, anterior and posterior, then that particular animal may have an incomplete digestive system. Okay, so uh, in relation to the reproductive system of the the nematodes, we need to understand that the nematodes are basically dioecious. Okay, so uh, okay. So the in terms of the the sex of the, the nematodes, they are considered to be dioecious. Okay, so what is mean by dioecious? This is basically a condition of which in order for the reproduction to occur, a, a male or a, an organism, a roundworm, must, must mate with an opposite sex. Okay, so once the, the male individual will copulate and do the fertilization with the females or mating with the females, then we will be expecting that the females will release a particular um, offspring. So a females can be either viviparous or it could also be, or it could be uh, described as an oviparous. So uh, a viviparous females may tend to produce directly larvae, while the oviparous will tend to lay their eggs. Okay, so that's what makes the, the roundworm similar to the human organisms because we are following a, a dioecious type of sexual orientation. Okay, so we have to understand as well that if we are talking about the reproductive tract of the female, when the females release their larvae or an eggs, they, us they used to have a different opening, which is considered to be a vulva. So the vulva is separate from, from the, the, the anus because for the, fem the female individuals or the female roundworms, their anus are only used to release undigested or waste materials. <clears throat> In the case of the release of the larvae and the eggs, they have the presence of the vulva, which is another opening related to reproductive tract of the female. However, in the case of the male roundworms, both sperm cell and undigested waste materials will be released in the same opening, and that particular opening is now considered to be cloaca. And that's what makes the male and the female different from each other in terms of the release of their digested materials as well as their sex cells. Okay, am I making sense? Can I have a thumbs up reaction from the class or a heart reaction from the group? If you have understood the discussion so far, so far, thank you very much. Now we will proceed with uh, the next. So uh, talking about uh, the different roundworms in relation to its uh, human impact. So these are the five major or common nematodes or roundworms that are available to cause infection to different human organisms all across the globe. So we have the Ancelostoma caninum. I would like to remind everyone to please remove the C here. So it should be Ancylostoma caninum uh, that may cause hookworm infection. We also have Trichuris trichura that can cause tri trichuriasis. We also have Ascaris lumbricoides 
or ascariasis, trichinella spiralis, trichinoliosis, and interrobius vermicularis. Now, the selection of these identified roundworm parasites are based on the frequency of their order prevalence of infection. Okay, so the first thing that we need to understand is the ancylostoma caninum. So ancylostoma caninum is also known as hookworm. Okay, so if we try to look at the adult stage of the ancylostoma caninum, they are usually gray in color. So sometimes the ancylostoma caninum, male and female, may appear as reddish in color if there is blood in its alimentary canal. So usually when the ancylostoma caninum will, will suck blood as part of their nutrient consumptions, they will uh, use that blood to release or to ingest the necessary uh, nutrients. And some of these bloods will go directly to their alimentary canal. And, and when we are going, when you are going to microscopically examine an example of an, of an ancylostoma caninum adult, you will be able to observe that instead of being uh, gray in color, they appear as reddish, okay? Like any other uh, roundworms, their body is covered by a non-living cuticle that sheds at molds, allowing for growth of the nematodes. So, mura po siya of snakes. So, uh, they will undergo the process of molting in order to shed the outer cuticle and this cuticle will be really will be uh, re replaced with a bigger cuticle that would match to the development or the increase of the size of the ancylostoma caninum. So both ancylostoma caninum and male and female are basically has the presence of the buccal capsule. So this buccal capsule contains the mouth and the teeth, which is used. Uh, for the ingestion of food materials. Now, at the back of the buccal capsule, you can see the presence of the, the pharynx. So the pharynx is a club shaped in appearance. And this pharynx now is very muscular, which corresponds to the action of this pharynx for a, for a powerful, powerful pump in order to make sure that the food materials will be then forwarded uh, going to the esophagus, okay? So uh, now if you're going to ask me, Dr. Yong, Sir Yong, how are we going to distinguishably uh, characterize which one is a male and a female kanainu? So one of the distingu distinguishing characteristics that we can use to identify which one is a male and a female is actually on the tail end of the ancylostoma caninum. Because if you try to look at the male ancylostoma caninum, the male ancylostoma caninum is actually made up of a copulatory bursa, which is consists of three lobes, one, two, and three. And these three lobes are subdivided with three supporting fleshy rays. While when we are talking about the, male, the female ancylostoma, their tail is actually described as conical, which is different from the male, which is expanded because of its, of its copulatory bursa. Now, in general, female roundworms are, are lower, larger compared to the male uh, roundworms. In fact, for the ancylostoma caninum, their length is 10 to 12 millimeters long and its diameter is 0 0.36 millimeters wide. Now for the female, its length is 14 to 20 millimeters long and its width is 0 0.5 millimeters, including its pointed tail. Okay, so that is how are we going to differentiate the male and the female ancylostoma in reference to its measurements. Now, uh, talking about the ancylostoma, uh, when, when the male ancylostoma and the female ancylostoma will perform the process of population, they tend to undergo uh, mating, so they will produce this fertilized egg. So the ancylostoma caninum eggs 
are usually thin shield and it measures about 60 to 75 micrometers. Okay, and its width is 35 to 40 micrometers. Now, basically class, when this uh, ancylostoma caninum eggs will be freshly excreted and they are considered to be fertilized egg, we will be able to observe the presence of this developing embryo. So this developing embryo has produced around two to eight cells inside the body of the ancylostoma caninum because these two to eight cells have undergone the process of cleavage. Okay, cleavage as in cleavage. Okay, so cleavage in the sense that there is now as a distinct separation between one cell to another cell. So that's what makes what that's the process of how the developing embryo is seen in the freshly excreted eggs of ancylos ancylostoma canino. Now, uh, if an individual or a, a community is infected with a with this cocoon infection, there are four prevention and control measures that we need to consider. The first one is to sanitary dis is the sanitary disposal of the feces. So if we are talking about sanitary disposal of the feces, we are talking about the proper way of disposing or putting our uh, un undigested fecal materials. We don't simply defecate in one particular area. We need to find a particular room or somewhat a space or a, a, an area in the community where there is a proper disposal and that particular fecal material will be directly stored and uh, free from access to any individuals, particularly the children. So that is, a, that is what uh, sanitary disposal of faces is all about. Another thing is avoid the use of night soil as fertilizer. Now, uh, sir, bakit emphasize mo na we have to avoid the use of night soil as fertilizer? Usually kasi, <clears throat> di ba, maraming mga plantita. So they, they usually love to, uh, to take care of their plants during night time kasi wala talagang sa hindi mainit. Kasi ang mga plantita, di ba, galing sila nagpa, nagpa, kanang, saan na nagpagluta, di kan sila nag, nag, nagbutang o number five na astringent, mga RDL, mga maxipil, so hindi sila gusto mo ma-expose under the heat of the sun. So that is also the same thing with the ancylostoma. So if this particular nematodes are in the soil, they tend to go to the deeper portion of the soil layer during daytime because they, did, they don't want it to be exposed by the heat of the sun because the tendency of them is that they will die. So they will become activated and they will go to the surface of the soil during night time. So that's why, uh, especially if there is a prevalence of hookworm infection in the area, the people should avoid the use of night gabi, night soil as fertilizer, because that would also be the time that the that the ancylostoma caninum will move forward to the surface of the soil. And in that particular case, there is a chance that there will be transmission or infection, mode of uh, infection to occur to the page, to the people. So that is the second prevention and control measure. The third is, of course, uh, wearing of adequate protective footwear, especially for the children. So they need to have slippers, closed shoes, or open shoes, so long as they, they are not allowed to play barefooted. So wearing of adequate protective footwear. And the last prevention and control is treatment of infected individuals and health education. So of course, we need to make sure that if you're infected with this hookworm infection, you need to go to the hospital, undergo the process of examination, and um, 
if there is a prevalence of infection in the area, we need to educate all the people, not only the children. So those are the four. Now, uh, aside from that one, uh, in, in the laboratory, one way of diagnosing if the patient is positive for such infection is finding eggs in the feces. And that's the only laboratory diagnosis that we can do. Okay. Next, we have the trichuris trichura. So that if ancylostoma caninum is known as the hookworm, trichuris trichura are what we call the weak worms. Jonathan? Sir? Na makita ba yung ginachat ko doon sa chat box? Yes, for sure. Ah, okay. Sure. Okay, so basically, class, when we talk about trichuris trichura, we are referring to the whip worms. So the whip, whip worms are long, and uh, some of them are coiled. But when we are talking about the, the examination, in order to identify if this is trichuris, what we are going to do is to consider the, the body structure of the trichuris trichura. It is because if we try to observe, all trichuris trichura have a very thin anterior or front portion of their body, while the back portion of their body is actually expanded or broad. Or broad. So that's the basic uh, way of, of knowing the trichuris trichura adult. Okay, so trichuris trichura is basically the weak worm that can cause infection known as trichuriasis. So heavy infections of this weak worm can result in prolapse rectum, murashat al muradas. It could also release, uh, it could also uh, cause growth retardation and even finger clubbing uh, that occur in the children. Okay, so basically class, we need to understand again that the front portion of, of the trichuris trichura is located in the tiny end while the expanded body is where the part of the trichuris trichura where the reproductive tract as well as the digestive, some of the digestive system parts are located. <laughs> Now, uh, this uh, tiny anterior portion and expanded back portion of the lecturis trichura can be seen not only in the female, but as well as in the female trichuris trichura, okay? However, if we are going to distinguish which one is a male and a female, of course, we need to go back again in terms of its measurements because this is trichuris male. It measures up to five centimeters in length. Okay, so if you try to look at the posterior portion of the male uh, trichuris, it is coiled compared to the straight tail structure of the female trichuris trichura. Okay, so this uh, male is actually uh, made up of a singular long testis. And this testis are basically convoluted. So it's not smooth, okay. So the testis, uh, the, the front portion of the testis is actually made up of a vas deferens, while the vas, while the back portion of the testis is basically contains the ejaculatory duct, which is connected towards the cloaca in order for the release of the sperm cell. Okay, so we need to understand class that this cloaca, which is located in the, in the caudal portion, or the terminal portion of the trichuris male is, uh, contains the stickle, which is fundamentally used in order for the mating to take place. So this stickle and this cloaca is basically used uh, in order to make sure that the fertilization will take place because the stickle will be the one to attach the female uh, trichuris and the cloaca now is used uh, to release the specific sperm cells via the ejaculatory duct, duct. okay? So uh, while if we are talking about the female, if the test, the, the male 
uh, trichuris is bas basically five centimeters in length. For the, trich the female trichuris, it measures up to seven centimeters in length. And the uterus, this area over here, if you try to observe the lemon, the lemon shaped eggs, so this makes the, the, the uterus of the female trichuris mm, kanang clarusha in terms of its uh, anatom anatomical structure. So mas makita mo talaga diretso yung uterus ng female trichuris because it contains dark dots. Those dark dots are lemon-shaped eggs. Okay, so together with the uterus, it has the oviduct as well in the front in the uh, front portion towards the tail end or the caudal end, while the uterus contains in the front portion uh, going to their mouth. It contains the vagina as well as the vulva. Okay, so uh, aside from the male, the adult trichuris, we have to understand as well the eggs of the trichuris trichura. So if you try to look at the structure or the shape of the trichuris trichura, it's basically ellipsoidal to barrel shape. And the measurement of this trichuris trichura is 50 to 70 micrometers in length and its diameter is 25 to 35 micrometers in width. Okay, so one, so one of the distinct characteristics that we can that we can recognize in the trichuris trichura egg is the presence of a prominent bipolar plugs. So mauna nga, if you are going to observe this under the microscope, you can definitely um, observe the that that is trichuris trichura egg because of its prominent uh, bipolar eggs bipolar plugs. So the the four major parts of the trichuris trichura is the outer shell, which is basically the protective covering of the trichuris trichura. They also have the presence of the inner shell. Inside is the developing embryo, which is basically somewhat granules of proteins. So they don't have such presence of a larval structure, but rather somewhat a protein mass. And they also have the presence of these bipolar plugs. So the female trichuris can basically produce a range of 3,000 to 20,000 eggs per day. Okay. So once that these eggs will be, will be released externally or through the, in the environment, then it will embryonate uh, within three weeks and it will be deposited in the moist, in the moist soil in the shade. Okay. So uh, most of the individuals will be infected with this weak worm infection or trichuriasis once they will be able to acquire uh, the, the, or ingest embryonated eggs of the trichuris trichuris. Okay, now there are three major prevention and control measures that we need to consider for trichuris trichura. First is the sanitary disposal of the feces. Second is to avoid the use of night soil as a fertilizer. And third is to treat all infected individuals and undergo health education. Okay, same with Ancylostoma caninum, we will be able to diagnose the presence of trichuris trichura in the laboratory by finding the eggs in the face, the faces of the patient. Okay. Now the next uh, identified roundworms that we need to consider is the Ascaris lumbricoides. So Ascaris lumbricoides is considered to be one of the largest and the most common parasites found in the humans. It is because it is estimated that 25% of the world's population is infected with this worm 
the ascaris lumbricoides. In terms of its measurement, the female ascaris is longer compared to the male, which, which measures up to half a meter long, while ascaris male is generally shorter. Okay, so um, we can also distinguish, aside from the measurement, we can also distinguish ascaris male and a female by looking at their tail end. Because for the female, the female ascaris is large and it has a straight tail. But in the case of the male ascaris, it is short or smaller, but and it its tail is hooked because of this uh, curved tail structure that will be used for mating. Okay, now uh, aside from the male and female ascaris, another thing that we need to consider is to characterize the four classification of ascaris lumbricoides eggs. We have the fertilized, fertile eggs or fertile ascaris, decorticated eggs, embryonated eggs, and then fertilized eggs. Okay, we have to uh, know class that the outer shell of the ascaris is basically convoluted. Okay, because if you try to observe, it's crooked. For the fertilized eggs, they're the, convol the convolution, the convoluted uh, outer shell of the fertile eggs is in reg is actually appears in regular pattern. That's what makes them uh, different from the rest of the classification of the eggs. So this uh, outer shell is thick, and the layer that um, surrounds the the convoluted layer or convoluted shell is actually the mammillated layer. Okay, so the mammillated layer is basically the external part of the fertilized eggs, which is uh, which surrounds uh, the shell of the Ascaris lumbricoides. Now, if we are going to remove this uh, outer shell and the shell now becomes smooth, then the fertilized, the eggs, the fertilized ascaris now becomes decorticated. Okay. Okay. However, if the fertilized egg will develop and there is now the presence of an, a larvae inside the fertilized egg, then this particular egg of the ascaris now will be considered as embryonated. Okay. Usually, uh, these eggs, this uh, fertilized egg, before it becomes embryonated, its measurement is around 45 to 75 micrometers in terms of its length. Okay. While if the fertilized egg, while if the ascaris eggs is unfertilized, we can distinguish unfertilized eggs if their mammillated layer or the convoluted structures are irregular in terms of its pattern. See, there are uh, irregular protuberances outside. And usually the unfertilized egg is larger or longer compared to the fertilized eggs because these unfertilized eggs are basically measures up to 90 micrometers in terms of its length. And one of the distinguishing characteristics of the unfertilized eggs are basically the presence of granules or refractile granules. Okay. Now, if you're going to ask me, sir, uh, what will be the, the, the needed requirements in order for the fertilized egg to develop a larva? Actually, class, it requires 18 days for the development of the larvae. However, if, uh, and this development will only take place according to the three criterion, 
First, the environment must be moist. Second, it should be warm. And third, it should be shaded, especially if they are outside the body of the host. Again, there are three conditions that we need to consider in order for the development of the larvae to occur for 18 days, and that is moist, moist, it should be warm, and it should be shaded. For the Ascaris, the single female can produce up to 200,000 eggs each day. So in short, kung naakay duha ka female, nga nagalay active females of Ascaris na nasa inuhang lawas, in just three days, millionario na ka of Ascaris eggs because each single female can produce up to 200,000 eggs each day. Now, there are two diagnoses that we can use to identify the presence of Ascaris lumbricoides. The first one is to find the eggs in the feces, and the second one is to identify the adult Ascaris that will be expelled or be released from the anus or from the mouth. Okay, if, if heavy or severe infection to occur for the Ascaris, Ascariasis, ang uban magong mga bata, mga positive for Ascariasis, some of the adult Ascaris, instead of going to the anus or to the anal canal, they need to find any opening and sometimes they tend to be released sa ato ang nose, sa ato ang mouth, sa ato ang ears. So as part of the diagnosis, aside from the eggs in the feces, we can also diagnose the patient for positive Ascariasis if we are going to successfully identify Ascaris adult. Okay, now another, uh, another characteristic of another parasite that we need to consider is the Trichinella spiralis. So Trichinella spiralis is one of the smallest nematodes that infects human and they usually white in color. Okay, so we can identify uh, uh, from the general characteristics, uh, we can identify uh, male and female in terms of its measurement. Because in the general characteristic, female are usually lo longer compared to the, to the male uh, trichinella or the, to the male roundworms. So female is longer because the, the measurement of the female trichinella is from three to four millimeters in length. And its diameter is 0 0.06 millimeters. Okay, so this uh, trichinella is, in terms of its sexual uh, release of its uh, offspring, the females are, are basically viviparous because instead of laying eggs, they tend to release larvae. Meaning to say, the development of the egg to become larvae takes place inside or internally in the body of the female trichinella, okay? And once the, the larvae now is ready, it will be released uh, through the vulva and this particular vulva now, uh, this larvae now will be ingested in the intestinal mucosa. Okay, so we need to understand class that that in the case of the female, uh, the male trichinella, male is shorter because its length is 1.4 to 1.6 millimeters and its diameter is 0 0.04 millimeters. So in the process of mating, the trichinella is made up of an allay, which is basically located along in the along the cloaca so that when there is a time that mating or copulation to the female trichinella work will take place, then this allay or the claspers is used to hold, to hold the, the trichinella male and female for the fertilization or mating to occur. Okay? So um, we need to understand class that since the trichinella female is uh, viviparous, uh, we need to understand that 
once they release the larvae, they tend this larvae now will be ingested in the intestinal mucosa. And from the intestinal mucosa now, it will be uh, inserted in the muscles of the intestines. And this particular larvae now will be protected, encapsulated uh, by the use of a cyst. That's why it becomes insisted larvae. So if you try to look in the structure, this is now the cyst, which is formed once the larvae now is being released by the trichinella, female trichinella, and the larvae now is protected by this capsule. And this is now the larvae of the trichinella. Okay? So once inside, this larvae now measures 100 micrometers in length and six micrometers in diameter. Okay? Now, now, if you're going to ask me, sir, yung, look, yung, kung saan mahita po, paano sila mag-release or paano siya maging adult? Uh, basically, class, through the absorption from the nutrients na naasa muscles. And basically, class, we have to remember that the larvae will only be released from the capsule or from the cyst once it will now grow 10 times larger from the original size and once now the larvae will undergo or will complete its sexual differentiation. Meaning to say the trichinella larvae will be released once it is now identified as male and female. Okay? So basically class, this uh, uh, sheet, this uh, ellipsoidal shape of the trichinella measures 0.4 by 0 0.25 millimeters. Okay, so now trichinella are very common to pigs. So muna kung maadto mo sa agdaw public market, sa bagyerohan public market, you need to make sure that one that you are going that the meat that you the pork meat that you are going to buy should have any nodes. Kanagay mga tip mga bukol bukol sa ilahang sa meat because that is a, an indication that that meat is infected with trachyliosis, okay? So uh, there are three measures that are involved in preventing and controlling the spread of trichinella. The first thing is, is we have to avoid eating raw or undercooked pork. Kung magsuba-suba mo, make sure that you are going to really cook the pork. Kaya kung dilit ninyo makuan, ma makuk properly ang pork, uh, the tendency is na alang gihapon or buhi lang gihapon ang naasa ka ng capsule or sa cyst. Okay? Now, somebody asked me, one student from my previous class asked me, Sir, how about kung ilitsyon siya? Kanang safe ba ang baboy na from trichinellosis or tra from trichinella kung gilitsyon na siya? Uh, magdepende lang gihapo na siya class because uh, generally mamatay yun ang cyst ang larvae nga, nga giprotectahan with the cyst sa trichinella. However, there are some cases na special condition nga makasurvive siya especially if the thickness of the the capsule or the cyst is enough to for the survival of the larvae of trichinella, even if there is an exposure of extreme heat while cooking the lechon. Mm -hmm. But but the but most common um, cause of infection or the spread of the disease is is eating raw and undercooked pork. That's why the first prevention and control measure is avoid eating raw or undercooked pork. Second, we have to inspect meat for the presence of larvae, motosham presence of nodes. And if you are having pigs at home, na ginaalagaan ninyo, we need to make sure that you're not going to feed raw garbage to, pig, to pigs. So do not feed raw garbage to pigs. Now, uh, in terms of the diagnosis, one way, one there are two laboratory diagnosis that we can do first, we need to find a larvae in the muscles of the infected uh, host. 
The second thing is to test serum for trichinella antibodies. Okay, so that's the second. Uh, Second uh, diagnosis, we need to testing to do testing serum for trichinella spiralis. Ka usually magbuod pag once na ang pasyente or ang infected individuals uh, is having a disease known as trichinellosis. Ang tendency is that na ay ang iyang lawas will produce an antibodies, basically for the trichinella. And by doing the testing serum, the the testing serum can detect the presence of trichinella antibodies. Okay, now the last uh, anti uh, parasites that we need to understand is the Enterobius vermicularis. Now, this Enterobius vermicularis now is also known as the human pinworm. O kung sa bisaya pa, mauna siya ang gatawang na kigwa. So kung kanang, ay, muda na siya ang kigwa, ang Enterobius vermicularis, yes. So muna, kung naakay mga silingan, nag kigwa, then they are infected with disease known as enterobiasis and the costive agent is enterobius vermicularis. So uh, generally, if you try to look at the structure of the enterobius vermicularis, their body shape is generally fusiform or fusiform or fusiform. So the males are shorter because its length is two to five millimeters long and its width is 0 0.2 millimeters wide. Okay, and you can also detect or distinguish male enterobius by having a, a hook tail or curled tail. Now for the female, it's longer because it has a length of 8 to 13 uh, millimeters long and its uh, width is 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 millimeters wide and it has a pointed tail. That's why this uh, pointed tail of inter enterobius and its fossiform body is the very reason why their other name is pinworm. Okay, for the female, uh, for both male and female, they have the presence of the cervical allay, which is basically the opening uh, of the, is the area where it opens for the ingestion of food materials. So it, it has the presence of the mouth and it has also the presence of three lips. Okay, so aside from that one, we can distinguish morphologically uh, or anato anatomically the male uh, interobius and the female interobius by means of its esophagus. Why? Because the female uh, interobius is basically made up of a double bulb esophagus, while the male interobius is only made up of one single bulb, which is used to move the, the food materials from the cervical allay containing the mouth and the lips towards the intestine. Excuse me. Okay. So the eggs of the, the enterobius are usually found in the anus and uh, they are elongated and their measurement is 50 to 60 micrometers by 20 to 30 micrometers. So this is 20 to 30 and this is 50 to 60 micrometers in length. Okay, so there are three membranes uh, which covers the, which is composed in the pinworm egg. The first one is the inner lipoidal layer. This is the innermost layer. The, sec the third layer, the, the three layers are known as the middle layers or scientifically known as membrana lucida. And the third and the outermost layer is the albuminous layer or the albuminous membrane. So those are the five layers. So nganong three lang mga do? Actually five layers na siya. One for lipoid, lipoidal, three for the middle layers or also known as membrana lucida and the last one is the albuminous layer. 
Okay? So basically, the adult uh, enterobius are usually found in the small intestine. However, for the gravid uh, female or those females that continuously release eggs, they are found in the cecum and the rectum. Mauna, kasagaran sa mga gipangkigwa, naga kanang naay anak-anak sa ilahang ilahang kanang musayaw sila baka gilok magudaw na siya sa lubot because the eggs as well as the the gravid female once they release their eggs in the perianal skin magana-ana magudang adult sa kigwa especially the female so magliuk-liuk na munang gilok siya munang ang ang pasyente they tend to kanang mangatul gyud sa perianal skin that's why there are three uh, prevention and control measures that we need to do uh, when uh, there is uh, occurrence of enterobiasis. The first one is once uh, we have uh, the first one is to treat all the members of a family in which infection has occurred. So we need to say, kung, for example, kung si Kesha Marie, uh, kung five sila kabuk members in the family, tapos ang youngest uh, sibling ni Kesha or ni Kesha, Kesha, man, no? Kesha uh, is infected with enterobiasis or dikigwa, we have to consider all other members or all the family of uh, the Bibat family as infected uh, family. Nga man, pag once magud nga ang isaka sibling, especially the child, the youngest sibling, is infected, ang infection, ang transmission is, the spread of infection is very fast. Sagaran magud sa mga bata na infected with enterobiasis, they tend to kuot-kuot their lubot and they tend to kanang magkikapick up siya on the different surface but even sharing of food. So, so Kesha is mag-share ang iyang manggod ng ikigwa. So, mukaon si Kesha. So, there is now already the spread of infection. So, pas-pas kaayo siya. So, that's why we have to treat all members of the infected family uh, uh, members as of the family as infected, uh, if nalay infected individual is a mag occurs dito. Second is, uh, we have to consider the washing of the anal skin each morning soon after waking. So it's not only the youngest of sibling of Kisha who will do that, but even all the members of the, the Bibat family will do the washing of the anal skin each morning soon after waking and the bibat family are is also required to wash their clothes that are worn at, at night so muna nga hugasan da yun labhan da yun okay so those are the three prevention and control measures now for the three uh laboratory diagnosis the first is to find an eggs in the perianal skin so, look, yung, sir, yung, how are we going to do that? So, basically, we will be doing the scotch tape method or the cellulose adhesive tape method. So, ang ginabuat, sayang no, wala jut na naka face to face. But what we did, what I did with my class in Micropara, during this time, we are performing this as scotch tape method. So, what we do, we tend to go and, and interview street children. So, for each group, they are required to, um, uh, select three street children and that's, they are going to do scotch tape method to the three street children. So, pa, pa, tuwaron ang, 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 do, ang tulog ka street children tapos itaplak ang scotch tape. So, so yung duk yung literally yun na scotch tape o oh, literal yun yung scotch tape itaplak ni mo dito sa, sa, sa perianal skin sa bata. So, mo to siyang ibutang ni mo Ang katong nataplak ng scotch tape, mauto siyang ibutang ni mo sa glass light, then we observe ni mo under the microscope. So that's the first diagnosis. You are going to find the eggs from perianal skin using scotch tape method. Second, kung dili ka makaperform o scotch tape method, you are going to find an eggs in the feces mismo, sa tae mismo. Okay? And the third, you can also find adult worms in the feces. So those are the three diagnoses that we can do for Interobius vermicularis. Okay, so those are five uh, identified parasites that are very common to all humans that can cause infection. Um, although uh, for the humans, uh, these endoparasites are considered to be threat, 
to our health conditions, but we, we should not negate the other impact or relevance of these nematodes or parasites. Some of the nematodes are basically important because they tend to help in the, in the distribution of the population of bacteria and fungi in the environment. Some, the, some nematodes as well are very much important in relation to uh, the to other organisms, uh, other food sources. Okay, so muna nga, we cannot negate the, the importance of the, ne the nematodes uh, in, in the environment. Okay, so that would be all for our discussion this afternoon.